Amen. Once again, thank you, choir. Indeed, he has risen. Well, with that before us now, congregation, let me invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word. And uh, this morning, I have two passages I want you to turn to. Uh, the first is Luke chapter 8. We're just going to be reading four verses just to understand the context a little bit, and then we'll turn to John chapter 20. Uh, Luke chapter 8 can be found in most of the Pew Bibles on page 1001. I looked over a number of passages that we could spend time this morning meditating on the resurrection, and I landed on John chapter 20, which we'll read in a moment. I want to focus on Mary Magdalene and Jesus' appearance to her and why that is significant and why John records that. And I'm reading from Luke 8 here because Luke gives us her background, really just a tiny little glimpse at her past before she met uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to be reading Luke 8, uh, verses 1 through 3, and from this we'll go to John chapter 20. And as always, brothers and sisters, be reminded this is God's holy word. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. And then turn to John chapter 20 for our passage this morning. John chapter 20, that should be able, you should be able to find that on page 1052. 1052. John is the only one who records this appearing out of all of the four Gospels. And I want to read verses 1 through 18, but the majority of our time will be spent on 10 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. And said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but, didn't, but did not go in. And Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And there ends the reading of God's holy word. And as always, brothers and sisters, we are dependent on God the Holy Spirit to bless the preaching. Let's pray for his blessing at this time. Our great God and our Heavenly Father, indeed, Alleluia. 
with hearts of joy, your children this morning have great songs of praise to sing. Father, we have great joy because indeed our Savior lives. Indeed, our Savior has accomplished what you have sent him to do. And Father, this morning, as we come to this very word which you have given to us, Father, bless us abundantly. Father, you have told us that through the preaching of your word, you build up the church, you convert the lost, and you advance the kingdom. And so, Father, do all of that this day in our hearts and our lives. We pray, O oh Lord, send your spirit that he would open up this text through the preaching of the word, that we would hear his words, not the, the words of your servant. And Father, that these words would cause us to live and to sing joy, joyously today. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, a number of months ago, I, I think I've mentioned before, my wife and I took a emergency trauma medical course, and we looked at a number of things throughout that course of that day, but towards the end, uh, we focused on how to deal with a patient uh, once you've stabilized them, once you've stopped the bleeding, once you've stopped the obstruction, or whatever it is, to stabilize them as you're waiting for the paramedics and the emergency responders to get to you. And uh, we talked a little bit about shock. How to care for a patient when they enter into shock. And there's really two aspects of shock that you need to worry about. Uh, one is the physical shock. Uh, blood loss, hypothermia, a drop in temperature. Uh, you need to take great care and watch over them lest they go into shock and you need to start doing chest compressions to keep them alive. But there's another aspect of shock that he also talked about. That's the psychological shock. Oh, that is, he, he noted that his own personal experience, he'd witnessed this, whether it was a car accident or whether it was an active shooter situation, uh, whatever it may be, the teachers spoke of uh, the, the, the patient and how they will shut down psychologically because they've witnessed something so horrific. Uh, whether it's a, a defense mechanism that God has created us with or, or whether it's just the brain becoming so overloaded, it will actually shut down and they will not remember all that has taken place immediately. In fact, he even said that it may be hours or even days before that patient will start to recall all that they had witnessed because they're still in a state of shock. Well, this morning, as we come to John chapter 20, it's not the same thing, but it's something similar uh, of a, a shock that we see in the life of Jesus' followers. They indeed, on this Easter Sunday morning, all of those years ago, wake up in a state of shock. Just think, for example, of what they've been through the last three days. Uh, three days earlier, they went from walking and talking with their Savior, their, their teacher, whom they spent at least three years walking with, to seeing Him nailed to a cross. They went three days earlier from sitting down at a table and eating a meal with Him, rejoicing, to seeing with horror the brutality placed upon him to the point where he gave his life, and now he is dead. You see, these men, these followers, these, as we see this morning, this group of women who have followed Jesus for a number of years, wake up at the crack of dawn with grief on their heart, with shock in their mind, because the worst, most horrific thing happened a couple days earlier. Jesus was taken from them. And as we see in a few moments, as I hope to show you in a few moments, this wasn't just the death of a loved one, though it is that. It was really the death of their hopes. You see, for them, they believed that he was the Messiah, and, and this morning they wake up thinking that, that the Messiah was taken from him, that, that something had gone drastically wrong, that rather than sit on a throne, he now sits in a tomb. And you see, they wake up this morning with absolute despair, because everything was taken from them. All that they were living for was flipped upside down until they meet the Savior, until they realize what exactly He is doing. This becomes, really in their minds, the worst day transition to the best day ever as Jesus rises from the dead, as they come from shock to delight to realize what Christ has done. And uh, John, if you actually glance at a number of events in this chapter, looks at a number of events where Jesus reveals himself to the, the disciples in shock. But as I said, I want to focus only on Mary Magdalene. And I want to ask one question this morning. Why does John record this? Of all the other gospel writers, uh, he alone records in detail Mary Magdalene's experience. And, and as I studied it this week, I think it comes down to one thing. It is to highlight Jesus' care for the brokenhearted. 
In this story, we see Jesus tenderly cares for those who are broken hearted. And that's our theme this morning. We learn Jesus cares for the broken hearted. And I have three points to untangle this or, or to walk through it, uh, just really outlining the narrative. First of all, we wanted to know Mary's discovery, Mary's discovery and what she does when she discovers the empty tomb. Secondly, Mary's despair, how she responds to it. And then thirdly, Mary's delight as God opens her eyes and she suddenly realizes what really took place that morning. So Mary's discovery, Mary's despair, and then finally, Mary's delight. First of all, know with me Mary's discovery. And we pick up a little bit of this discovery really in verse 1. Look at your text. John records, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Uh, as every gospel writer records, it is early Sunday morning at the crack of dawn. We're told here that Mary Magdalene set out before it was yet light, and she's heading with one goal in mind, to get to the tomb to where Jesus was laid. Uh, early uh, in chapter 19, we were told that she was there, not only at the cross with uh, Jesus' mother Mary, but she also was there at the burial. Uh, she was there when Joseph of Arimathea uh, wrapped the body of Jesus with all of those pounds of ointment and, and laid his body in a tomb that was not his own. Uh, Mary Magdalene knew exactly where Jesus was buried because she was there when that stone was rolled in front of it. Uh, interestingly as well, I think it's actually Mark's gospel that records that, that Mary with the group of women uh, that was with her at this time, uh, as they made their way to the tomb, they were wondering to, to themselves how they're going to roll this stone away. Uh, they, ha, they knew that it was sealed by the Roman guards. It was a heavy stone. But to their shock and amazement, as they rounded the corner this morning, the tomb was empty. The stone was rolled away. But the first thing we need to note here about this discovery is that on this morning, it is the discovery of a devoted follower. Interestingly, we know there's other women with Mary, but John wants us to focus only on Mary Magdalene. That raises a question. Who is this devoted follower that discovers the empty tomb? Well, Luke 8 tells us just a tiny little background of Mary. The first thing we know about this woman who was coming to care for the body of Jesus is that she once was possessed, not by one demon, not by two, but by seven demons. Uh, Luke records that at one point she was possessed and dwelt by seven complete demons. And if you think about that, that detail tells us of how dire her predicament was. To have seven demons denotes a sense of fullness or, or, or of a full capacity of demonic possession. And so at one point in her life, she was possessed. At one point, she was not in control of her faculties. At one point, she was under the power of the evil one until Jesus delivered her. You see, at one moment in her life, this Jesus, whom she had never met before, came and met her and delivered her, drove those demons out, and from that moment on, you see, she was her Savior. He took her from the moment of bondage unto freedom, captivity unto delight. Jesus had already, in many respects, redeemed her from bondage, you see. And even more than that, being a demon-possessed woman denotes as well that she was an absolute social outcast. To be demonically possessed was to be driven away, out of society, but there was one person who cared for her. That was Jesus. Think of that. Uh, we're not told all of her background, but we can deduce that, that there was no one who really cared for her except the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you see this morning as she comes with grief on her heart, it's not just the death of a loved one. For her, it's the death of the very person who cared for her when no one else gave a second thought to her, freed her from what she could not be freed of herself, the demons who, in, who captivated her. And so you see this morning, Jesus was her most precious person uh, since he had already shown her great love. And we note here that she comes and she sees the empty tomb. Uh, we note later on that immediately they think, the group of women with Mary do not believe or think of the resurrection, uh, though Jesus had told them he was going to rise from the dead, but their thoughts go to human logic, uh, what human beings can do. And so immediately they think, not the resurrection, uh, they think thieves, they think grave robbers. From what I read this week, 
Uh, grave robbery was a common practice in this time, uh, but especially the, the possibility of the threat of Jesus' enemies. Uh, their minds were rushing to any possible solution except the very one Jesus actually had told them would happen. You see, what we get a glimpse is, is that Mary at this point is seen with physical eyes, not eyes of faith. Well, notice what she does in verse 2. She shares the discovery with others. We read, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Uh, you piece this together with the other gospel writers. These women run. Mary runs and informs uh, Peter and John, and, and those men immediately for themselves, or go to see for themselves, uh, the empty tomb. And, and John records that. We have the scene where Peter and John get in a running match. John gets there first, but Peter uh, runs in, and uh, they see really two details. One, they first of all, of course, don't see a body, but they see a pile of strips of linen. Uh, we're not entirely sure what that pile was like, whether it was all unwound and organized and laying there, or whether it was laying there in the form of the body as if Jesus' body just uh, floated out of it. Uh, but whatever the case, there was the linen that, John, that uh, his disciples and those who followed him just a couple days earlier wound around him with all of the ointment. And as well, the second thing they see is the burial cloth neatly folded, placed off to the side. Now, why does John record this? Uh, John records this because this is one of the key details of evidence that shows that it was a resurrection. If it really was grave robbers, if it really was Jesus' enemies, the last thing they would have done to a rotting corpse was to unwind it uh, and expose it from what was keeping the stench away. The last thing a grave robber would want is to spend all of the time to unwind it. They would have just grabbed the body and they would have run away. And so this detail shows that, that they're missing the point. This, this is a screaming detail that Jesus indeed had risen from the dead. In fact, actually, John tells us that John, verses 8 and 9, John, the disciple, believed in that moment. God opened his eyes to see and to believe what he at first did not understand. Notice, secondly, the author of this gospel focuses in on Mary's despair. Notice the heart of this woman. Notice her crushing grief. Look at verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Uh, the scene changes. Mary uh, uh, remains alone. Uh, the other group of women had gone on. The two disciples have gone on. And here is Mary. She's standing all alone. She has nowhere else to go. She can't think of anything other to do, anything other to do than to stand there and grieve. You see, what John wants us to understand is this woman is crushed. This woman is brokenhearted. This woman had woken up this morning already filled with grief, and now, if that were not enough to have everything taken from her, now she doesn't even have the body of her beloved Savior to even care for. It's almost as if God has taken everything from her in this moment. You know, we're not told this, but almost certainly she's wondering, why, God, can it get any worse than this? If it were not bad enough to lose him so horrifically, why would you not at least allow me to show one last act of devotion to the Savior whom I love? You see this morning, believer, she is crying because she witnessed the death of her Savior, the one whom she placed her hope in. And now she is robbed even of her devotion to serve him. The sorrow and the tragedy for this woman could not get any worse. And then we have this odd scene where she dialogues with two angels, one by the head, one by the foot. Interestingly, this is one of the very rare times when someone talks with an angel and doesn't fall down out of fear of being in the presence of angels. Uh, we're not told whether she understood that they were angels or not. Perhaps grief had so overwhelmed her. Uh, but notice the dialogue here. Uh, look at verse 13. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put them. 
Uh, almost certainly these are the angels that rolled the, ro the rock away. Uh, they did not appear to the disciples. They did not appear to the other women. Uh, one suggestion I, I found this week, I think this is quite uh, uh, possible, is that we're told that angels are ministering spirits. Perhaps these angels were told to appear to Mary because she is so crushed in this moment that she has a dialogue with them. But think of the question. Why are you crying? It's a tender question. But it's also a question, why are you crying? Don't you see the linen cloth? Don't, don't you see your Savior's not taken? He's risen. It is a question of angels prompting her to see and to believe. The angels are telling her to give up her grief, but rather cling by faith to the fact that Jesus had triumphed over the dead. And yet, she reveals the grief has so overwhelmed her, she still believes someone has taken the body. And then, in her despair, she has a conversation with Jesus himself. Look at verse 15, or 14, rather. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Uh, in this moment, we're not told why she turned around, but for whatever reason, in that moment, she turns from the angels and turns to this man who now is standing beside her or behind her, and he asks her a question, why are you crying? And we're told here that she did not recognize him in that moment. A lot of suggestions have been given. Uh, if you read Luke chapter 24, Jesus appears to a number of other disciples on this very day, and, and the same thing happens. He walks with them, and they do not have eyes to see until he gives them eyes to see. Uh, it's very possible that Jesus in his glorified body uh, is not recognizable at first until he opens their eyes. But I think even more than that is going on here. What is going on here is to show us that despite all the evidence of the world, unless God opens our eyes personally to see and to believe, we will not see what he truly has done. You see, Mary at this point is so overwhelmed with grief that the only thing she can possibly possibly comprehend is that Jesus is still dead. Why? Because dead people don't rise from the dead. You see, the only thing in her mind that she could possibly think that the number one solution has got to be thieves. Why? Because she has never witnessed before a dead person walking out of a tomb. You see, it is faith given to us by God's grace to, to remove the scales from our eyes, to see and believe, no, God does raise the dead. He's a sovereign God who gives life back to the dead, and Jesus did bodily rise that day. And I think even more than that for Mary, I think we could add this. It is the fact that she's so blinded by her grief that she still does not yet see her Savior standing there. And you notice, Jesus now speaks to her, and he asks the question, why are you crying? Same question. Why are you crying, Mary? And then notice as well, who are you looking for? That's an interesting detail. Not what are you looking for? Not a body. Jesus says, who are you looking for? Jesus is hinting to her again that she's got it all wrong. She's not looking for a dead body. She's looking for a risen Savior. Now, interestingly, uh, she's so overwhelmed with grief that she thinks he's the gardener who cares for the grounds, and she actually accuses him of being a thief this day. Imagine that. Uh, for one moment, he's standing behind her. Next minute, in her mind, hey, you're the robber. Listen, I won't tell anyone. Uh, let's just come clean. Uh, you tell me where you've put him. I won't tell anyone, and I'll just go grab the body. And even in that, you can see she's not thinking clearly. Jesus' body had been, had been wrapped with 75 pounds of ointment. A single woman by herself would have been unable to carry the body away, and yet, overwhelmed with grief, this is the only thing she could think of. Here is the point this morning. Her grief and despair had blinded her to the reality of the resurrection. And even more than that this morning, what John wants us to see is Mary's heart is so broken, her heart is so crushed that she is at the ends of herself. And really, I think we can say she's in the fog of grief. She just can't even think clearly because the worst things have happened over and over and everything have been taken from her to the point where she cannot even see Jesus there. You know, perhaps this morning you can resonate with Mary a little bit. Perhaps you know what it is to grieve the loss of a loved one. Perhaps you know what it is to, to lose someone you love dear and to realize that, that they're not around to talk to anymore or that the one whom you love now has passed on and, and there's nothing but this weight, this burden, and you have to say, it's painful. 
This woman is in the midst of painful grief at this moment. And even more than that, she's at the end of a crushing trial. Again, as I said moments ago, almost certainly in her heart, she's asking the question, why God? Why would you bring this upon me? Why would you crush me with such a heavy burden? And that's where we transition to the joy of the text. Notice thirdly and lastly, Mary's delight. She goes from absolute despair to absolute delight with one word. Look at verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. It is significant that Jesus says one word, and it's her name. And as soon as the words reach her ear, her heart leaps for joy, and suddenly she hears the voice finally of Jesus and cries out that he is her rabbi, her teacher. Now what's going on here? Jesus had just spoken to her. Why was it at the sound of her name that suddenly her eyes were opened? And I think there's a couple of things going on here. One, we're being shown what it is to have the good shepherd speak to you. Actually, in John chapter 10, Jesus in this very gospel says he's the good shepherd of the sheep. He calls his sheep by name, and they hear his voice. You see, when Jesus said Mary to her in that moment, she registered, she heard not just the voice of Jesus, she heard the voice of her shepherd. You see, Jesus is teaching us here that when he calls his sheep by name, when his sovereign grace enters the hearts of these people, he causes the understanding. You know, we have a caller ID on our cell phones now, but years ago, before we had that, uh, if someone called you, you had to pick up and, and answer to find out who's on the other end. If you're at your friend's house and, and your mom's calling, you know, you did not need for her to tell you, hey, this is mom. You immediately knew, oh, I can tell by the sound of that voice, it's time to go home. You see, Jesus spoke to Mary this day, and she heard the voice of her Savior. Why? She knew him in her heart. She knew him by living faith, and she heard the voice of her Savior. And that drives home this point this morning, that Jesus is the sovereign eye-opener. You know, she did not do this in her own strength. Moments ago, she spoke to him and did not register it. Christ gave her the ability to see and to believe, to hear and to understand. And, and, and here's the point that I want to emphasize now. Notice that Jesus heals the brokenhearted. Part of what John is teaching us here is the tender, compassionate ministry of our Good Shepherd. Notice that. But why does John this morning want us to see Mary Magdalene? What is, it, what is it about this woman that Jesus appears to first here that John wants us to take away? And I think here it is. Jesus cares for her. Jesus cares for those who are in grief. Jesus cares for those who are brokenhearted. And he comes first because it's almost as if Jesus doesn't want them to sit in that grief any longer. And he takes Mary out of the depths of despair, speaks to her, and gives her understanding. And then the other thing we need to note about this delight is in Jesus' presence, we have this difficult and seemingly odd exchange between the two of them. Look at verse 17. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go and say to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Uh, if you compare this with the Gospel of Matthew, we know that she's on the ground clinging to Jesus' feet. And she's holding on, and Jesus says, listen, Mary, don't cling to me. Don't, don't hold on to me like that. Now, the question that so many commentators spend a lot of time asking and trying to answer is, well, why does Jesus say this to her? Clearly, there's nothing wrong with touching Jesus' physical body. In fact, at the very end of the same chapter, Thomas will be exhorted to touch his hands, to touch his side. So what is it about Mary clinging to him that Jesus speaks to her. And there's a lot of bad suggestions that I came across this week. However, I think there's two very good possibilities that I will just present to you. I think on the one hand, it's very possible that he's just informing her that she doesn't need to cling, and he's not just going to disappear immediately. Uh, this view, I actually found from R.C. Sproul, I think it's, it's very accurate, or very possible rather, uh, that he's telling her, listen, I'm not going to ascend right away. You know, when she's holding on to him, it's almost like she's saying, I, I, I'm just not going to let you go. You were taken from me once, I'm not going to let it happen again. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, listen, Mary, I'm going to stick around for a little bit longer. I'm going to be here for 40 more days, and then I'm going to ascend to heaven. That's very possible. Another suggestion, and I lean a little bit towards this one, is Jesus is informing him, her not to cling to his bodily presence as if that's her only hope, 
but rather cling to him as Savior because he's about to ascend to heaven. Uh, the reason I think this is likely what is going on here is because for Mary, she just wanted to be in the presence of Jesus. For Mary, just be near him. He was her treasure, and that's good and proper, but Jesus is informing her what he informed the disciples in chapter 14. It is good that I leave you. It's good that I'm about to ascend to heaven. Why? Because I'm going to send my spirit. Mary, yes, it's great that I'm back, and I'm going to come back one day, and we're going to spend all eternity together. But Mary, I have work to do in heaven as your mediator. Do not cling to me, my physical presence alone. Cling to my work that I've done to you. Now, I'm just going to present those two options to you and leave it up to you to decide which one you like, but I think both of them accurately represent what is going on in the text. But notice as well, and this is the last thing we see here, notice that Jesus describes what he has done as a change in relationship to him and his people. Notice he says, go, be a witness to my disciples, and what are you to tell them? Tell my brothers that there's a difference in how they relate now to God. A couple of things here, it's so beautiful. Jesus says, go tell my brothers. Think of that. Jesus describes his disciples as his brothers. Why? Because he has joined us in this world to purchase us so that we would be adopted by the Father. What a wonderful reality. Jesus is the natural, eternal Son of God. We are the adopted children of God. And notice that Jesus wants to emphasize our new relationship. He says, I'm about to ascend to my God and your God, to my Father and your Father. Jesus in his human nature is telling us, listen, because of what I've done, I've adopted you. Because of what I've done now, rising from the dead, you now belong to God. You now have a heavenly Father, and you now are adopted as my own. Here's his point. Jesus is teaching Mary that his resurrection accomplished this saving work. And then in verse 18, he sends her as the first missionary, as it were, to inform the disciples, not only that, not only that he's risen from the dead, but inform him of his message. And again, here's the point this morning that we are to see, or I think we're to see. Jesus comes to minister to Mary's overwhelmed heart with the gospel. Notice that. Her, her heart longed for the presence of her Savior, but Jesus says, it's better than that. I'm back. I've raised from the dead but I've accomplished for you an eternal work of salvation. Why does this calm a brokenhearted person? Because Mary in this moment realized that she once was lost, but now is found. She once was blind, but now she sees. What's happened? She realizes, I've been made right with God. My Savior is alive, and He's accomplished all that God has promised for me. See, Mary had lost everything, but on this morning, she gained everything back again. She learned, I have eternal life with God the Father who loves me. My Savior is alive because of what He has done for me. And as she runs to tell others the good news, she goes with joy because this cannot be taken from her. You see, that morning she thought everything could be taken, but now she realizes nothing can be taken from me. My Savior has secured for me this great salvation. And what I love about the story of Mary Magdalene is to highlight Jesus' care for His people. He comes to those who are captive and bound to free them. He comes to the social outcast to whom no one else cares for, Jesus cares for. He comes for the brokenhearted because he feels their pain. And you see this morning, that's where the gospel comes in. Why is it that Jesus did all of this? Christian, this morning, the only answer the Bible gives is because he loves you. Why is it that Christ died on the cross, rose again from the dead? is because he wanted to call you brother or sister. You see, this morning, the wondrous teaching of this text is that you and I have a Savior who cares about our grief, who cares about our bondage, who cares about the sins that we wound up and and walked in on our own. Why? He wants to free us so that we live with him forever. Christian, rejoice in that this morning. Or maybe let me put it this way. Do you know this freedom? Do you know what it is to be bound to sin, captive and unable to be free, to cry out and to have your prayers answered by a Savior who loves you? This morning, that's the Savior we serve. He loves to free captive people. And this morning, we rejoice that He opens the eyes of those who are blind. Let me ask you the question a different way. Can you say, like Mary, Jesus is your all in all? Oh, what a joy it is that we come here knowing there is one who loves us even if no one cares for us. And he loves us enough to go all the way to death itself to redeem us. So in conclusion, just two 
brief thoughts that I, I want to just kind of wrap this all up together with. First of all, this teaches us today that our eternal hope is secure. You know, throughout this country and really throughout the world, there'll be many people celebrating Easter. Even unbelievers will be celebrating the festivities, but they're missing the point. Why is this day so important? Uh, it's so important because something in real history changed. That, that death no longer has to sway over us, that Christ has conquered the grave. You see, this day is significant because we as Christians do not need to fear death. We have been adopted. We are in a new family. And that means that as we go from here, we are living new lives even now. That's what Easter is all about, new lives. Secondly, and I've already kind of got ahead of myself, but let me give it to you again. Secondly, it teaches us that Christ cares for the grief and the brokenheartedness of people. You know, I've read this a couple of times in counseling books, but, but if you've ever been in a grief or a time of grief or trial, you know, isn't it true that you feel all alone? You almost feel like no one can understand what I'm going through, that, that you feel like, that, like you're all alone. Christian, believer, listen, you're not alone. Even if no one can possibly understand what you're going through, Christ can. Part of what John 20 tells us is that you have a sympathetic high priest who knows what you're going through, cares what you're going through. And even as you shed tears, as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we need not fear any evil. Why? Because Christ is there with us. Christian, this morning, uh, grief and pain is not the one that has the final win. Christ has. Uh, let me ask you, are you going through a trial this morning? Are you in a time of grief? Christian, look to your Savior. He knows your pain this morning and walks with you in it. What a joy it is to be a Christian. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Heavenly Father, how we thank you that Christ indeed has triumphed over the grave. Father, we thank you for a passage such as this that reminds us that Christ is our tender, sympathetic high priest and good shepherd. Oh, Father, we pray, send your spirit now that as we go from here to celebrate throughout this day, this resurrection from the dead. Father, apply now by your spirit's power uh, unto our hearts what we have seen. And we ask this in Christ's name alone.